Okay, it's kickoff time, and um, thank you, Marty, for bringing me in again here. Uh, actually, he told me that I had been around when uh, Federal Reserve Bank was started in 1913, so I've, I've got some, you know, California state dollars from there. Yeah. To, uh, go. So, okay, so uh, we had a really lot of fun, Maureen and Ellen, last night. Uh, some of them, we got some good zingers, so hopefully I'll be able to put them in. Uh, but uh, I really appreciate them coming in. Maureen, we've had uh, probably three or four panels. Mm -hmm. And Ellen just met, but she um, seems like a pretty nice lady. So uh, Maureen, actually, I'll give you a couple minutes to describe mm -hmm. your stuff. I, if, if she does not, um, you know, want to stay in the asset management business, I took notes that she's lived in Brazil, London, New York, Telegraph Hill. I don't know, every <laughs> wow. place else. Keep so <laughs> maybe that's a good entree to uh, your, your uh, career. Um, so my name is Maureen Downey, and uh, I'm a managing director with uh, Beneficent Company. Uh, Beneficent is a, a regulated trust bank that provides uh, liquidity services as well as custody and other fund services for GPs and LPs. Um, my career, in short, is that uh, I was a banker for a number of years um, in in Europe, and then I came back to the States, and then for about the last uh, 15 or so years, I've been on the buy side, um, doing uh, secondary transactions, both uh, direct uh, into companies, as well as uh, funds and structured transactions. I've also done uh, quite a few primary investments, as well as co-investments, but also direct investments into companies. And uh, for the last six years, I've spent uh, time uh, helping to develop two fintech platforms that have a focus around um, alternative investments and basically broadening that market to create greater liquidity and more access uh, to different investors, but also investors who need to get liquidity in their, their assets um, that they would want to get out of before, say, the term or the company exits. So I'll just pause there. Okay, so uh, there's lots more uh, when Maureen speaks on specific Tom, but I just met um, Ellen and she's, she was actually sitting uh, in the uh, Harvard Club of New York City bemoaning the dress code of where some, you know, rag muffin sort of stayed in, in the place. And uh, fortunately, Ellen, it's not that bad. The, uh, the US Senate is now uh, adopted uh, dress code, so we won't Thank see. Goodness. Uh, so, isn't that a great deal? So, go ahead, <laughs> Alan. Tell them a bit about your career. Um, basically, my background is that after uh, business school, I started in public finance uh, when there was a public finance, and when that went the way of the buggy whip, I segued into private clients. Uh, I was a director of private and trust bank at the Swiss Bank. We heard Marty talk about that. And then on to Bear Stearns and Morgan Stanley and so on and so forth. And coincidentally, I happened to fall into the ultra high, high net worth uh, arena. And I found that the companies that I was with, these bulge bracket firms, were very keen on you selling the soup du jour. And what I did was, okay, we put together a portfolio of the basics, because that's what these companies do. But these clients really needed alternatives, special little nuggets that were different than just anything you could find on the internet. So I started poking around looking for these little nuggets and I was not able to help my clients with them. So I started my business about 12 years ago and I have, I'm licensed with a broker dealer and I have people that come to me saying, you know, all these wealthy people, will you help me? And I, that's what I try to do after I do my due diligence, which this conversation is going to be all about. Okay, so that's, that's great. My background's uh, well recorded uh, at LinkedIn. Um, and so USC undergraduate went directly to Harvard Business School. At that time, we majored in really uh, management of highly diversified companies where G plus W and Teledyne and LTV were around, something that's sometimes, you know, really valuable when I go to different companies now. Uh, I went to Monsanto's corporate 
venture capital group then spent about 25 years in transportation leasing containers ships rail cars over the road trailers chassis and uh, actually you know later on just spent 14 years in the new york stock exchange company cai which was just purchased last year and but in addition uh during the interim periods there uh is one of our companies the sam zell company was sold off to g capital ended up uh, cfo of biotech a couple of biotech companies a couple of semiconductor companies a broker dealer and now i'm on the board of directors of a couple of companies one is an intel funded company and uh, also an educational tech company. And most recently, uh, my claim to fame has been writing my class notes for my Harvard Business School class. And at this advanced age, I will have that as a lifetime job because nobody else <laughs> you know, has enough energy to write you know, the quarterly newsletter. And then um, we also are doing for the USC Trojan Knights, uh, one of my uh, colleagues from school has been on the Rhodes Bowl Committee uh, for the last uh, 30 or 40 years. And so we're co-authoring a, uh, a weekly blog during the football season on commentary, not only on the Pac-12 or 10 or 4 or 2 now, and, and also uh, the whole college scene. So, uh, you know, we in prior years, we talked about really small things about manager selections. But we started off this conversation, I think I'll let Maureen talk and then Ellen on this particular topic about what's changed. Because, you know, it seemed like in a lot of places, people are sort of talking their book or maybe talking last year instead of what may come in the future. And, you know, the two comments that I make is, you know, uh, that uh, Bill Aikman, he talked about, he thought the 30-year treasury was going to five and a half percent, which will be a shock to the system, especially for high tech companies. And then uh, Jamie Dimon, who, you know, this is not going to advance his presidential hopes as he wants to run as a Democrat, but uh, he, uh, he basically said, you know, uh, five and a half percent may not be the top of the Fed funds rate. I don't want to, you know, get you guys concerned too much, but there's certainly a possibility to get as high as 7%. So in that kind of world, you know, we may have different things. And I thought, Maureen, when you talked about what changed in the last few years, uh, you know, especially on late change, late stage funds and the, the markdown, and you talked about different prices and things mm -hmm. like Canada or Latin America. So why don't you start that off? And then, Ellen, you've got a little bit different base in terms of it. I mm -hmm. they, they're not as impacted by that. But why don't we start off with that whole discussion, which I thought was extremely good for bringing us up to date in the current market. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Gary. So, yeah, we did have an interesting discussion last night. And I think, you know, when I think about uh, the current environment and how you go about approaching portfolio construction and also manager selection, I think it also the key question is to what type of investor are you? Like, are you a pension? Are you endowment? Are you kind of like one of those larger institutions, uh, non-tax paying? Versus I think Ellen would probably be better positioned to talk about, um, say, tax paying. Uh, institutions that um, it, it's, it's quite a quite a difference in my perspective. Two is what is your existing portfolio look like right now, and also what are your liquidity constraints or needs? Um, so those are kind of I think three kind of real basics there. What I have seen, um, and I think we've all seen in the last say, twenty years, is a you know, quite uh, a period of very easy money, and in fact it became extremely easy in the last three to five years. To the point where I think there was a lot of distortion in the market when it comes to asset valuation, asset pricing. Um, I have invested across all different types of private asset classes and also across all different geographies and stages. One thing I can say is that, you know, having spent more time, maybe a bit more on the growth and the venture side in the last six, six years, you have, we've seen an unprecedented amount of money that is non-traditional uh, capital come into the growth and the venture space. So if you look at from like 2000 to 2000, or 2010 to 2020, the amount of capital that firms raised alone was 3X, like what they were doing in 2010. And then if you layer on all of the non-traditional investors who kind of come into the space, 
you know, the soft banks, you know, uh, mutual funds, uh, some of the insurance companies who are basically really trying to get into private companies before the, the steepness of their growth slope basically started to tail off. You just had so much money coming to that. And so what that, what that manifested itself into is that you didn't really have to do a public IPO. You could do a private IPO because you were raising some of these companies between hundred million to 500 million in some of the later <laughs> stages of raising. And in addition to that, um, you didn't actually have to really look for an exit, right? You could keep getting this money uh, as a source of continuing to kind of propel your growth without actually really having kind of a reckoning, like saying, okay, when are you profit? When are you going to be profitable? Right? And one of the reasons why uh, people didn't have to go public is because they also get access to credit. It's one of the reasons why you mm -hmm. go public is they access credit markets. Yeah. So, you know, for public, um, you know, it's one, it's the greatest marketing uh, period of your, your corporate life usually is when you do a public, but you're right, you actually then get an acquisition currency. So if you want to go buy something, you know, i.e. Facebook, you know, I've made a number of acquisitions, but then also to you get credit too. Right. So great Facebook, Microsoft, Google, they each have acquired Apple, all acquired more than 250 companies in their career of being public. Right. So I remember doing some analysis a few years back, and it was 1999. Uh, private companies stayed private for about four years. And I think, you know, looking at that just even two years ago, they were saying the average private company stayed private now for 13 or 14 years. That has had huge ramifications in the industry because, uh, one, companies are, you know, staying private. So then if you're a public, you know, company investor, you're then kind of forced to, again, start to get into more, I would say, pre-IPO investing. But also very importantly, and I don't think many people are as aware of this, if you're a venture fund or if you're a growth fund or even a buyout fund now, you have a lot of companies that stay in your portfolio longer than your fund term. So this is produced also in the market, in the secondary side, this whole phenomenon of what we call GP restructuring or fund restructuring, as these funds kind of continue to basically want to extend or you know, basically form a new fund or take assets from older funds and then seed them into the next fund that they're trying to raise. So there's been a lot of really interesting developments that have happened in the, in the alternative space. The last thing I would say with this um, kind of coming of, I'd say, easy money, um, you're kind of getting to a point of a little bit of a reckoning here because um, many of these uh, growth companies are uh, venture back companies relied upon either easy credit or access to capital from say non-traditional um, venture investors to basically be able to continue and propel their growth. But as that money supply has become more difficult and it's become more expensive, you have a lot of investors now saying, okay, what's your profitability? Like what's your operating plan? Like how are you going to be able to um, run your business without actually raising more and more rounds? In addition to that, um, if they do need more capital or if they do try to access some kind of exit, you're seeing a lot of down rounds. And I think there is a bit of a reckoning that's coming right now and a lot of down rounds are gonna happen. And that is, I think, one of the bigger questions as to if you don't have to go public or if you don't have to raise another round, that's probably good because it leaves your valuation a little bit untouched. But if you do have to get capital or if you do have to seek an exit, you know, this is where I think you're seeing some big drop-offs right now in terms of valuation. So why do you think during the period of easy money that basic investment principles that beforehand, EBITDA, things like that, almost disappear and then when it went to revenue, you said, not worry about this, but then times of tough, tough money, we're right back to the principles that we had. What, what changed in, the, in that person's in that mind theory? to say, I'm going to just forget about that? I think there is like a, um, irrational exuberance to use a Keynesian term. I mean, like I remember 2005, six and seven, right? And I remember, I mean, I started my career doing leverage finance and I was like, what is this covenant toggle light? You know, these terms, I was like, who's giving away all this money with no, I, I just was like, how does this happening? Right. And then we all saw it happen. Right. You know, in 08, 09, I think you just had so much money come into the space. Um, that people were so afraid of um, not getting a good deal. I mean, I remember looking at companies that I had an opportunity to invest in, and I remember one was WAG and the other one was Rover, and I was looking at both of them. And basically, I think SoftBank had put money into both of them, and basically the pitch was like, well, if you don't take my money, then I'm going to give it to your big competitor. I mean, there was just a lot of just undiscipline, so to speak, right? Uh, 
I mean, first of that question, I probably, I think the two big things are FOMO, which you mentioned already, and also the two things, the two additional things are that the people on your capital stack had infinite amounts of money they could lend you if things got rough, mm -hmm. right? They were already deeply committed, mm -hmm. right? And then also because you could borrow as much money as gap financing, you never really had to worry about actually delivering the product. Mm -hmm. I mean, look at like Beadworks, oh, right? Classic. Yeah. I mean, I mean, that's, there's so many. So having gone down and invested, we were talking about this last night in emerging markets, um, they don't have the ecosystem that we have in this country. And so it's really hard for them to raise uh, around A or around B. It's friends and family. Maybe they get some like BFI money. Maybe they get some government money down there. And usually they're so much more focused, not so much on growth, but on profitability. And so if I come here and I'm looking at a series A company here, they're going to be able to raise way more money than say a series C or series D company down in one of those say developing markets. The discipline is, is, is very different to the point on the easy money. Um, you know, we kept, or I said we kept, but the, the government and the fed kept rates extremely low. And they basically kicked the can, you know, after 08, 09, down, you know, basically uh, down the alley. I mean, it's what allowed basically all of the big bio funds that were so over levered, you know, to basically pay down their debt because they were all underwater from an equity valuation standpoint after 08, 09. And, and maybe a third factor is globalism, mm -hmm. right? You're launching something to capture a global market, right? And maybe with anti-globalism, a lot of these markets that people assume were going to be available really weren't. Yeah, I think it's uh, that's a good point, especially as you see some of the reactions, especially in China, to trying to, one, keep U.S. or European companies out, particularly U.S., but then even in their own markets with some of their own tech companies, they basically put a damper on that because of what those companies are potentially doing to their um, socio-demographic issues. Education is a great example in that, that perspective. So I think, you know, we kept um, the cost of funds down so low that in some respects, there wasn't a lot of accountability because people just assume that they were always going to have this very inexpensive cost of funds. And it prompted, I think, one, a lack of discipline, but I think also just a huge rise in asset values. I mean, um, to me, it was very um, concerning and dis disconcerting in 2021 when I was watching the stock market and real estate values just increase. And that uh, no one was really concerned that this would be a precursor to potentially inflation. I mean, it's just, so I think there's some other people that are far more educated and more talented than I can speak on this, but I mean, I think we're kind of now seeing um, the, the outcome of that. And I also am concerned uh, about that rates will probably uh, go potentially even higher. <laughs> well, I mean, I think a lot of moral hazard was created from all of this, but I mean, every, every time there was a crisis, they drop rates, mm -hmm. and, and which invited more moral hazard. We have a generation of people that don't know what it is to not be in an environment of cheap, easy money, right? That, that's the problem here. So, like, uh, you know, I um, uh, manage a team, and so many people, they, they, they've started their careers well after now, 2008. They don't even remember, like, you know, uh, before the dot-com. And so that's... Uh, for, for better or for worse, it's a perspective that you have if you've been doing this for for a longer time. But we literally have about 20 plus years or so where we have really, really low rates historically. And so you have a lot of people that are in the workforce who don't remember life where you actually had um, higher interest rates. Yeah, I mean, if you, when I was uh, growing up, they used to say, don't trust anybody under 30. Uh, <laughs> one guy at our corporate VC fund, uh, you know, said, for his 30th birthday, I'm not over 30 yet. He said, don't criticize me till tomorrow. But if you look at 2008, a guy gets out of his MBA program, maybe 24, 25, that says, you know, today, 40. So maybe you don't trust anybody uh, under 40, or even worse, if you have to go back to 2000, or, you know, or, or if you want to go back to, you know, Jimmy Carter errors of 19, you know, 78 to 80. You're basically 70. saying only trust people in this room right now. Yeah, that's <laughs> right. And then maybe I should have, uh, maybe I shouldn't have had my wife dye my hair uh, because if you saw all this gray hair, I'd probably be the smartest guy in the room. I still remember the Great Depression. So, well, one thing that, uh, and I'm going to do this as a segue to Alan, 
since in many cases during those boom times, people were doing uh, cocktail due diligence, cocktail party due diligence. And Alan, in your case, uh, you said a lot of people uh, didn't want to get the soup du jour of the normal uh, investors' banks. And so you decided you'd start your own firm in terms of zeroing in for high net worth people, getting to know personally, uh, not on just a Zoom call or a cocktail party, and then uh, trying to find a specific uh, product that would meet their needs. So that's a completely different uh, kind of approach. So maybe you can describe it. It was very interesting to talk about it uh, last, uh, last night. Yeah, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of people come to me because they know that I know significant high net worth individuals who are major investors. And uh, that was good. Um, now she froze up. Uh, should we uh, just keep on going? Oh? I would just keep on going. I, it's her side. It's not, it's not us. Yeah, now you've frozen up. Um, hopefully it's not too bad. Yeah, so things can change around. Um, you know, uh, Saddam Hussein actually spoiled my birthday, August 2nd, 1990. I was there with Gold Sachs because they were trying to sell a part of uh, Sam Zell's empire. We walked in, around the night before and the guy told me, he says, you know, in the small amount of, of space that we talked in the business district near the Imperial Palace, that real estate is worth more than the entire amount of real estate in California. So the next day, we go into the office, everybody's head bowed. He said, you know, Saddam Hussein invade, invaded uh, Kuwait last night. So that, in it, the Japanese stock market really has just hit uh, the top level where they were there back in, in, in 2000, 1990. So that's a long their market to cover. Uh, if you want to talk about a sagging stock market in front of zero interest rates forever, that's a, that's a good time. But what happened to uh, Ellen? I think she got kicked off. She's coming back. She'll okay. be logging back in. So we'll go ahead on to the next thing. I, I think that you know you had some sort of interesting things in terms of the ventures and uh, what do you think today in terms of you know especially with family offices there's always divorces there's uh, there's kids that go off in wild directions you saw what uh, you saw that uh, Elon Musk talked about his daughter being a communist you know uh, and uh, so then you talk about people that, you know, just decide to split the family up. The Fox News series, uh, Fox Business has a tremendous uh, series on people breaking apart and fighting like crazy. The Vanderbilt being, you know, tremendous amounts of those. So you see some of those things. So what happens when those things happen? Uh, do you kind of have to liquidate portfolios? Is there peaceful uh, mm. kind of nasty divorces or, or what? What happens there, especially when you might have assets that are worth a lot less than what you thought they were a few years ago? Yeah, it's a, um, I think maybe a, a context in the overall question of secondaries. Um, so the secondary market really started back in the, I would say, late 80s, uh, 1980s, and it's grown and really evolved and it covers many different asset classes and many different stages. And it's also become a very accepted part of portfolio management. And uh, in the institutional side, um, you know, probably about two to three percent of the AUM kind of turns over every year, and about eighty percent of the volume in the secondary market uh, for institutions is done by about sixteen firms. So it's very concentrated. What I will say is that the fastest growing part of the LP market today is high net worth, ultra high net worth investing in family offices. So that is the fastest by far segment of the LP base. And if you take a look at the developments like IEI Capital, Case, and then all of the RAAs that are trying to develop alternative products and trying to put that on their platform, this is a trend that's definitely going to continue. What is not there 
is a way for these individuals to get out of these private assets uh, that they've allocated to. And part of that Can is- Can you give an example? <clears throat> well, <clears throat> I actually have some investments myself. Uh, I used to work at Goldman, but I'd love to get rid of <laughs> these 2005 funds, right? And they just keep going on and on. There's no real way for you to sell it easily. <clears throat> um, part of it is because um, you usually need an intermediary when you're selling in the market, or you need to be very savvy yourself to know who the buyers are. And a lot of times when you're doing the sale, it's basically like an M&A deal. You need a sale and purchase agreement. Then you also need this thing called transfer documentation, where you get the GP or the private company to agree for you to sell, and then for them to agree to put you know, the new buyer either on the LP, you know, cap stack, or on the cap stack of the company. So the company I worked for, <clears throat> and there's some others that are doing it in different variations. The company I worked for basically came up with an innovative legal approach to this, where instead of being an SEC registered entity or a fund or RAA, they're a regulated trust bank. So they're essentially a custodian. And so what that does is that removes um, three of the main friction points you have when you're trying to do secondary. One is that usually if I'm going to give you a price for the assets you're trying to sell, I need to get the financial information either on the fund interest or on the company. Usually, let's just use a fund example. Um, usually, to be able to do that, you as the LP can't give those, that information to me unless you have the permission of the GP, which usually means you have to go to the GP and you have to ask them to say, can I please send my financial information on the fund to them, plus any of your quarterly reports or annual reports. Now, the GP, and they've become very savvy in this, can say no. You can send it over to these guys because I want them basically to give me you know, $2 more for my next fund. And so there's all different ways in which the market has evolved. In this situation, and usually um, if you want to get a good price, you want to go out to like 25 buyers, right? Not just two buyers. So that's why you hire an intermediary. And then you have to get a lawyer to do the comp agreements between the different parties. So it just ends up being very expensive and very time consuming. In this situation, because um, Beneficent is a custodian, and we have actually an online portal. As you go into the portal and you click through it, you essentially make Ben your custodian. And so you can upload, you know, basically there's four documents you need, which is uh, the LPA, the cap stack, uh, the annual, and then the quarterly. It's uploaded and because Ben is a custodian, therefore a fiduciary, you're not triggering any um, breach of confidentiality. And we sign copies all the time. We don't have a problem with that. But if this is where, you know, if you wanted to get a quote, uh, and then this is a, a very easy way to do it. <clears throat> the next step is, um, and we have a kind of an online kind of technology transaction kind of system, but when we get done with the valuation process, it goes out automatically to the client, like here's your proposal, here's what we would offer to you. If you like it, <clears throat> there's about a 20 page, very standardized document that's attached to the economic trust, which just says, yes, I'll take the consideration. And then I will basically transfer my assets to this trust. And you are now the custodian. And <clears throat> the bank details of Ben basically gets uploaded to the GP or the custodian. And then you, the client, walk away with your consideration. And then the third part, which is usually the other, I would say, friction part of a secondary is the transfer process, where you have to transfer it from the original holder to the new holder. And that actually doesn't need to take place because Ben is actually a custodian and can just hold them in custody. But that is something that you as a seller don't need to worry about. We take care of it as a company. So those are the three points that <clears throat> are solved for. So to your point and your question, um, how does this uh, work with families or uh, I would say, you know, non, I'm gonna say non-institutional, but not institutions. We usually say that there's the three E's, door, uh, death, divorce and demise, which kind of drive people to have to seek liquidity. And when I mean demise, it's like, I have a really big family business. It's facing some liquidity issues. I need to uh, liquidate some of my other holdings to support that business. So that's going to drive the desire for liquidity. All the time, we get people who are looking to seek liquidity because they've had a divorce in the family and they need to kind of allocate those assets amongst the different party members. And some of them want cash. Some of them are willing to take the assets in kind. And then, you know, unfortunately, a very big driver of it is divorce. And it is very uh, usual in high net worth divorces that you have private assets, be they funds or interest in companies, and somebody needs to put a value on it. Usually you go to a forensic accountant, but they're not always the best people to do that because they're not necessarily the market 
experts. So that's kind of what drives, I think, a lot of individuals um, to come and those three things versus I think on an institutional level, you get a new CIO that comes in and they don't necessarily want to have to deal with the last the last CIO did and they want to clean it up and they want to take that money and they want to reallocate it to new managers and managers. Yeah, so that's that's pretty good knowledge. It's uh, detailed. Now, Alan, uh, we better get you to continue your conversation before you get kicked <laughs> off the island again. I but know. you're back. And, and my video of you all is blank. So I'm not sure what's going on. I, well, we can anyway. see you. Okay, good. So um, we were talking about cocktail party due diligence and the kind of things that, that I have to do. My manager selection is very different than a lot of people that work at these bulge bracket firms because there's a team that does it. They do the selecting. They do the manager selection. And, and you have a, a list that you're allowed to choose from. What I do, which is very, very different, is that people come to me, they're interested in, in raising money. I think that they seem interesting, but I have to do more than that. I have to find uh, interesting deals and opportunities that I believe that my clients, my reach would like, because otherwise it's a waste of time. I don't want to show somebody something that I know that's not in their bailiwick. So having said that, as people come to me and they say, gee, I, I want to do a raise. Can you help me? I do. My turn is significant due diligence myself before it gets to my broker dealer. I have to feel like I know the as, as uh, Tracy was saying, you really have to know the managers. You have to make sure that their background is who they say they are. They are true to their product. They've uh, you feel confident that they've had expertise in man in their selection of founders. And um, it's important to me that I, personally that I meet the people that I'm dealing with. I want to bring them, be at the Harvard Club or aware, but I want to bring them to a place where we can sit down, have a cup of coffee, a lunch, drink, whatever. And it's it's not a Zoom call where we're sitting there with our papers going, I'm so great because here's what I do, blah, 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 blah. And that's the end of that. And that was, you know, a half an hour, 45 minutes. What I like to do is really spend time with the people. It, it's, it's a reflection on me. If I haven't felt like they're honest, they have a great passion for what they're doing. And I feel confident that I could put my own money in if, if I were liquid and, and I was able to, uh, go to our friends here to say, okay, let's get some liquidity. Uh, it's important that I felt like this is something that I want to shout from the rooftops. Hey, this is great. This is really great. And here's why. And I've, I've spent enough time reviewing them. We have to know about the subscription agreements. We have to know whether it's Wilson Sonsini or whomever that's helping them. Somebody with great credentials that has uh put their documents together. Um, and anyway, so that's what I do as far as manager selection. Yeah, so that's uh, actually one comment we got. This is Maureen's comment, but maybe I can say this here. You probably need to do due diligence on who you're dealing with and become your client because oftentimes those guys get into difficult mm -hmm. situations. Her comment last night was if you uh, lie down with do dogs no, get and wake with up with fleas. Now, last night we had a whole bunch of people showing pictures of their dogs, you know, <laughs> with, uh, you know, laying on them. But that's not that's not the particular issue of this. Uh, you really got to have some honest guys, you know. And there's a lot of you know, mm -hmm. money that's come from around the world. You may not want to mm -hmm. deal with some unsavory characters, right. or really characters. So, right. so that's good. You know, the other thing we uh, another comment that I thought was pretty good, and it was that we've got these post-economic people you deal with, mm -hmm. that they sold something big, mm -hmm. uh, you know, during the good times, and now they don't have to go back to work. And uh, I've seen this a lot in terms of the early stage angels. They made a big hit in SAS or some uh, type of, of tech investment, mm -hmm. and then they're experts on that field. 
So they're kind of the, the first guy to go in the, the first angel rounds. But, uh, you know, those kind of guys now, if they kind of overspend, and a lot of the guys overspend, uh, the uh, Bloomberg said they just found out through revised data that Americans have, have saved like $1.1 trillion dollars uh, less than they thought during the last five years. So maybe in these real wealthy people, what happens then? You know, you've, you've come to them, they have it. It's again, the big fast li li liquidation. And then it's, there really is, what I found is there's not, for all these people selling these private funds, it really is hard to liquidate. You know, opportunity zones are 10 years. Mm -hmm. So if something happens during the 10th year, uh, you unwind some of your benefits, but after five years, you have, you have to recapture it. Not so much important in California taxes because it's a non conforming state. You know, we had one guy talking yesterday about an art fund that, you know, there's again, you know, want to get out of it, sort of liquidity problems. Uh, there's not a, it, there's a lot of problems in that. So it seems like the big thing is the portfolio size, how much you should put in uh, the private funds. We talked yesterday about uh, venture mm -hmm. debt, same thing, even though you can get a much better return, it's not necessarily that easy to get out of. So I guess in the importance of portfolio sizing and having liquidity through, you know, maybe stressed out, maybe it's not bad that you have a, one of the guys, you know, Kelsey talked about 25% in you know, short-term bonds, because that's a decent return today. So I, today, any, yeah. you know, we've got about 10 more minutes, maybe five more minutes. So five. is there any, is there any comments you guys would like to say that you think um, we haven't covered in this session? I might say something. I think <clears throat> a couple of things. I mean, when you're putting together a portfolio of liquids, you know, you have to look at the context of your overall portfolio. But one of the things that I always <laughs> took a look at during different economic times was like, how much capital do I have at risk? Because you know, you're always going to be getting distributions back, and then you'll have to be making capital calls depending upon the maturity of the portfolio. And I think that's something to be uh, aware of. And I used to kind of look at this over long periods of time, and I would see it be anywhere between like 57%, you know, to say 71% if I was looking at a bigger portfolio of assets. So I think that's one thing, the capital at risk. And then in the context of where you're going to actually need capital for other things unanticipated. The other thing that I would say, though, and I wanted to say this earlier in the, um, in the discussion, is that, you know, the 2010, 11, and 12 vintages, great. they are some of the best vintages out there in the last 10 years. And that's because people were very reticent, especially in 09 and 10, to put capital to work because they were so busy trying to shore up the investments that they made in like 06, 07, 08. So I did a little analysis. I don't have the numbers in front of me, <clears throat> but looking at how much capital is trying to be raised by managers with target fund sizes between 100 and say 650 now, just like in North America. And I think that they had not even achieved over 50% of the fundraise. So there's a lot of GPs out there and it's definitely kind of in all the conversations about how it's a tough fundraising environment. But the managers who do prevail and the managers who are able to put the work money to work, you know, and I think it's not just maybe in venture, but in growth are going to do probably really well because in order for you to raise the money now, and then the opportunity is given the liquidity pressures that many of these companies are going to face, you're probably going to have some pretty good vintages. And so the question is, how do you pick the best ones? Right. Um, so that's just one thing I would, I would leave out there. Um, you know, again, when I kind of look going forward about how I think about it, it's obviously, Thematically, where do I think uh, there's going to be a good opportunity in the next three to five years? And that has some macro influences. And then two, also from a sector standpoint, but then also the GPs, you know, and I think the key thing with GPs is you do want to see a track record because you want to be able to get comfort that they're going to be able to do it again. I think it's also really important to take a look at whether or not they're raising an incremental, a lot more money because doing the check size of 35 million is very different from doing a check size of 150 million. It's a different skill set potentially. So there's a lot of factors that go into it, but I think this is an interesting time because it's very different. There's been a lot of chaos, you know, a lot of changes. And, you know, it's funny, uh, my kids are in Mandarin immersion school, despite, I don't, it's a longer story, but the Chinese character for um, <clears throat> opportunity is the same one for chaos. 
So I think we're just in for a really interesting period. Yes. So that's some good notes. Um, Helen, how about some comments there, in particular to your guys, who of course are in a bit of a different situation here? Well, I, I, I've got people sitting on a lot of money. Having said that, um, I've got VCs that were extraordinary, have been extraordinary, but now it's more considered a down round. And how do you put apples together with oranges? It, so um, some of these VCs that have a down round, it, it's not going to be feasible to get investment there. Uh, and you just have to turn the page and start a new chapter. Um, I, uh, I have had people that come to me with a fair amount of money. I've got one guy who did well in a business and he's got a billion dollars to spend very specific. I want specialty lending companies. So, uh, I'm on in the market now of looking for something that's a little bit different, it's not exactly private equity. It's more M and A, but, um, investors, have their particular niche and as they come to me i try to talk to you brilliant people about what have you got you know what arrows do you have in your quiver that i can uh, possibly work with that makes some sense for these people that have um, money still to spend and are interested in deploying it because they don't want it to just sit in, in an account although they're getting a little bit more percentage now than they had been in the past but We've, as a community, we've all had some hiccups with the banks that you all experienced out there on the West Coast, which had ramifications to what we do here on the East Coast. And um, besides people experiencing, you know, the hardships because of Maui or the floods or whatever, I, there's still ways to be um, careful about doing your business and helping people with exactly what they need. Okay, well, that's all. Thanks for the good comments here. It may be a good segue now to our next uh, meeting. I would say one thing we don't talk about here, but I think is important, is also besides this money, uh, we've got to have some good personal relationships. And that uh, Absolutely. Number the one. secret of happiness is really like, uh, there are some guys that are pretty visible with lots of money, and there's some guys with not too much money that are really happy. So uh, I'm going to tell you just this is my last story. It's not too long. Uh, so for about uh, for, for four or five years, uh, Sergey Brin was our neighbor, you know, a dozen houses down from us. And until uh, he got the heap home from his wife over, you know, going out with another gal. And so what happens is we're going by that house and uh, my wife says, you know, that guy has like 10,000 times more money than we do. But, you know, it doesn't matter because he doesn't have any better weather than we do. So, <laughs> which is true. You know, that's true. So, uh, yeah, stay happy, guys. So stay trying to have a good, decent uh, time. That's one thing that's actually probably just as important as uh, all the money you have in the world, right? At least for me, it is. Wait, yeah, so have all the money. Thank you, Gary. Thank you, Maureen. Yeah.